Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second session of the online colloquium Pluralizing the Anthropocene, Reenvisioning the Future of the Planet in the 21st Century. My name is Elena Freitas. I am Professor of Biodiversity and Ecology and in the UNESCO Chair in Biodiversity and Conservation at the University of Coimbra. I will be the moderator of this evening's session. We distinguish STS scholar Kate Crawford, whose latest book, Atlas of AI, Power Politics and Planetary Costs of Artificial Intelligence in 2021, is making headlines all over the world. Good evening, Kate. Welcome to Pluralizing the Anthropocene. Before moving on the pro to a proper introduction of Kate's distinguished scholarly career, I would like to say a few words about the background of this colloquium, especially for those who, were, who, are, who are joining us for the first time. Let me start with a few acknowledgements. Pluralizing the Anthropocene builds on a creative partnership between several institutions re representing the sciences, the arts and the humanities, the Research Center for Anthropology and Health, the Foundation of Sahadr, the International Research Network Science Tech Asia, the Center for Functional Ecology, Science for People and the Planet, and the Department of Life Sciences at the University of Coimbra. Many thanks to these institutions for making this colloquium possible. Many thanks also to the members of the Sahalj technical team for their support. The present decade, the third of the 21st century, will be decisive when it comes to addressing the current environmental crisis before we plunge into a conjecture of chaos Confusion, confusion and rising inequalities, even more disturbing than what we were already experiencing in the present. There are many people denying the relevance and the urgency of these concerns, but even these people cannot, rely, cannot really ignore ongoing debates on environmental destruction, climate change, and the future of human life on the planet. These are the biggest challenges of the epoch we live in, the Anthropocene, or the age of humans. The term Anthropocene was coined by the late atmospheric scientist Paul Crutzen in a conference sometimes in the year 2000 to highlight the role of human activities in the climate change. The term was then appropriated by, by geologists to refer to the present geological era as a period in which humans have become one of the most potent geophysical forces in the planet and their activities leading to increasing environmental uncertainties. There is still no consensus within the geophysical sciences on the date of the beginning of the Anthropocene as a geological era, but most would agree that the environmental impact of the human planetary expansion has become increasingly visible after the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. In the last two decades, the term Anthropocene has gained increasing popularity behind, behind the geophysical sciences entering the humanities, the social sciences, the arts and the media, and leading to the development of critical alternative terms like Capitalocene and many other, all of which define in relation to the original concept of the Anthropocene. Whichever, whichever, whichever we, have, uh, we, we may look at this concept, the Anthropocene has entered global cultural and political imaginaries as some kind of hyper-object of magnet that helps capture the tensions and the dilemmas of the age we live in. An age, an age that is marked by increasing anxieties about the future of human life on the planet. But the Anthropocene is not just above a runway world of environmental doom. It is also about overcoming disaster and catastrophe and creating new visions of hope and justice. The realities of environmental pollution, anthropogenic climate change, species extinction, and sea level rise compel a re radical reimagining of humanity's place in the world, well beyond make do patchwork interventions like green capitalism. The colloquium pluralizing the Anthropocene is an attempt to develop a more inclusive and diverse understanding of the challenges ahead. Using the term Anthropocene to refer to the current age of increasing anthropogenic environmental uncertainties has started new conversations about what we need to be changed in the global economic system, but it has also generated a monolithic understanding of the Anthropocene as a unified human experience. The framing of the Anthropocene around an universe, universalizing species paradigm as a homogenizing effect that hides significant exclusions and inequalities. 
Not all humans are equal, equally implicated in the major forces driving contemporary human environmental crisis. And not all humans, and hardly any non-humans, are invited into the conceptual spaces where these disasters are theorized or responses to disaster formulated. The second session of Pluralizing the Anthropocene features scholars in the humanities and social sciences whose work is strongly committed to a more diverse and inclusive understanding of the challenge of the Anthropocene. Every talk will be followed by an informal conversation and a key and day session with the audience via the chat function. The chat function is currently closed, but it will be open towards the end of the talk. If you'd like to ask a question, please prepare your question, have, have it ready to be posted in the chat box once the QA session starts. This talk will be conducted in English. If you need language assistance, Microsoft Teams has a live transcript function located in the right bottom corner of the application. Please feel free to activate it. Please bear in mind that this event is being recorded by Schalfs and will be later released for public viewing via the internet. But let me go back to the main reason why we are all here. Earlier this week, we had anthropologists Arturo Escobar and Marisol de la Cadena making this case that the challenges of the Anthropocene require not just moving away from the capitalist paradigm of infinite growth, but also moving beyond the limitations of modern ontologies and epistemologies. Today, we have distinguished STS scholar Kate Crawford, who will talk about the global interconnected systems of extraction and power shaping contemporary empires of artificial intelligence. It is a great honor to have Kate with us today. Professor Kate Crawford is a leading international scholar of the social and political implications of artificial intelligence. She is a researcher professor of communication and STS at USC Hamburg, a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research, Research New York, and an honorary professor at University of Sydney. She is the inaugural visiting chair of AI and justice at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris, where she co-leads the International Working Group of the Foundations of Machine Learning. Over her 20-year research career, she also produced groundbreaking creative collaborations and visual investigations. Her project, Anatomy of an AI System, with London Yoller, won the Bisley Design of the Year Award and is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York and v and in London. Her collaboration with the artist Trevor Plagan produced Training Humans, the first major exhibition of the images used to train AI systems. Their investig investigative project, Excavating AI, won the Ayrton Prize for the British Society for the History of Science. Crawford's latest book, Atlas of Artificial Intelligence, Power Politics and the Planetary Costs of Artificial Intelligence, published by Yale University Press, has been described as a timely and urgent contribution by science and named one of the best books on technology in 2021 by the Financial Times. Kate, I am truly delighted to have you here with us. Many thanks once again. Ladies and gentlemen, Kate Crawford, Atlas of AI on Deep Time, Deep Tissue and Deep Space. Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helena, for that very kind introduction. I'm going to try and share my slides now, so we'll see if we can make the magic happen. Let's see. Yeah. So far, so good. Uh -huh. No, one more minute. And here we are. Let me know if you can see that. Yeah, that's perfect. Well, hello, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to be joining you today, and it's particularly an honor to be joining this wonderful series, Pluralizing the Anthropocene. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands from where I'm joining you today, the Musée Lanape, and recognize their elders past, present and future. For those of you who aren't familiar with my work, uh, in recent years, I've been focusing on understanding the social, political and ecological contexts of artificial intelligence. 
And this year I published a book called Atlas of AI. And one of the underlying arguments of the book is that AI is the new extractive industry of the 21st century, while simultaneously being imbricated with traditional extractive industries. So in order to understand that, we need to look at the different sites where AI is made. And I mean that, of course, in the fullest sense. So for today's talk, I'm going to give you a short overview of how we might consider this topographical view. And then I'm going to explore some of the underlying dynamics in the wider political economy of AI and planetary computation. So let's start with a deceptively simple question. What is artificial intelligence? Well, if you type AI into Google image search, this is what you get. Blue grids, floating numbers, you have men in glasses staring into the middle distance, and lots of white robots. And of course, they're always white. This is a deeply problematic but very common framing of AI. It's all very abstract, ethereal and immaterial. It is, if you will, the ultimate view from nowhere in the cloud. But if we account for the full materiality of AI, we see that AI is neither artificial nor intelligent. Rather, artificial intelligence requires vast amounts of natural resources, energy, and human labor. It's a giant infrastructure project with logistical demands that span the planet. And in contradistinction to this idea of a disembodied brain, AI is not akin to human intelligence, and of course, neither is it autonomous or rational or able to discern anything without computationally intensive training and predefined rules and rewards. In fact, the design of artificial intelligence as we know it depends entirely on a much wider set of political and social structures. And due to the capital required to build AI at scale, these systems commonly serve the existing dominant interests, such as the military, policing, and the corporate sector. So in this sense, we can think of AI as a registry of power. So for the Atlas of AI book, I wanted to leave the nowhere places of algorithmic abstraction to go to the very specific somewheres where people and institutions are making choices, from the US to Indonesia, Malaysia, China, and the Congo, from toxic black lakes in present day Mongolia to the extinction of entire species of tree in the Victorian era to produce submarine cables. And this is why I use the concept of an atlas. Atlases are of course unusual types of books. They allow you to engage at different scales. You can look at a continent or you can zoom in to a city. And I think we need these scalar shifts to truly understand something as vast as contemporary networked computation and information capitalism. Perhaps my favorite account of how a cartographic approach could be useful comes from the physicist Ursula Franklin. She wrote that maps bridge the gap between the known and the as yet unknown. They are testaments of collective knowledge and insight. So this book owes a great deal to all of the scholars, artists, and advocates that I've had the honor to work with over the years that have helped to shape my views. There have been many communities, but also individuals such as Simone Brown, Wendy Chun, Alondra Nelson, Lucy Suchman, Jeff Bowker, and many others. So maps at their best offer us a compendium of open pathways, shared ways of knowing that can be mixed and combined to make new interconnections. But there are also maps of domination, those national maps where territory is carved along the fault lines of power, from the direct interventions of drawing borders across contested space to revealing the colonial paths of empires. So by invoking an atlas, I'm suggesting that we need new ways to understand the empires of artificial intelligence. Ultimately, this is a step towards a political economy that accounts for the states and corporations that drive this industry, the extractive mining that leaves an imprint on the planet, the mass capture of data, and the profoundly unequal and increasingly exploitative labor practices that sustain it. These are the shifting tectonics of power in AI. And 
And I believe that a topographical approach offers different perspectives and scales beyond the abstract promises of algorithms or the latest machine learning models. The aim here is to understand AI in a wider context by walking through the many different landscapes of computation and then seeing how they connect. I think there's another way in which atlases are relevant here too. The field of AI is explicitly attempting to capture the planet in computationally legible form. Now, this is not a metaphor so much as the industry's stated ambition. Um, we could look to, say, the AI professor Fei Fei Li, who describes her ImageNet project as aiming to map out the entire world of objects. Or in their textbook, Russell and Norvig describe AI as relevant to any intellectual task, truly a universal field. And then we have one of the founders of AI and the early experimenter in facial recognition, Woody Bledsoe, who said, and I quote, in the long run, AI is the only science. So this is a desire not to create an atlas of the world, but to be the atlas, the dominant way of seeing. And I think this colonizing impulse centralizes power within the AI field. It determines how the world is measured and defined while simultaneously denying that this is a political intervention. Just like the medieval European Mappa Mundi, which illustrated religious and classical concepts just as much as coordinates, the maps made by the AI industry are far from being neutral reflections of the world. In contrast, my aim is to work against the grain of colonial mapping logics and to embrace different stories, different locations, and alternative knowledge bases than the ones that we commonly hear in the dominant colonial pioneer narratives of AI. So the precursor to this book was a collaborative project that I did with Vladan Jola of the University of Novi Sad, where we studied and mapped the entire life cycle of a single Amazon Echo, from the minerals to the data processing, all the way through to the device disposal in the ground. Now, doing this project was actually a much bigger exercise than either of us expected. It actually required us to dig deeply into the very disparate domains of supply chains, pay scales, smelting practices, and, and container shipping paths. And when we completed this project, I wanted to expand the analysis beyond the single device of the Amazon Echo to consider the entire planetary network of the AI industry itself. So that was the motivation behind the five-year project of writing Atlas of AI. I structured the book around eight core chapters as geological strata of AI, if you will. It starts with the earth and moves through labor, data, classification, affect, state, power, and space. But in order to give you a quick tour through some of these ideas today and how it may connect to pluralizing the Anthropocene, I'm going to take a transverse cut through these themes to address three different sites of extraction, bodies, time, and space, or more specifically, deep time, deep tissues, and deep space. On deep time and AI, we'll consider the politics of rocks and brine, because AI is made of minerals and fossil fuels. In deep tissue, we'll consider the politics of ligaments and sweat, because AI is also made of human bodies. And lastly, we'll go to deep space, which is the final frontier of AI's extractive practices. So let's turn to the first domain, deep time. We can see the effects of the design of large-scale computation in our atmosphere, in the oceans, and in the Earth's crust. This is a typical view of San Jose from a plane making its final approach to San Francisco International Airport. It's an aerial view of the tech sector's ideological home. Below you are the empires of Silicon Valley. There's the gigantic black circle of Apple's headquarters, then Google's head office, which is nestled close to NASA's Moffett Federal Airfield. This was once a key site for the US Navy during World War II and the Korean War, but now Google has a 60 year lease on it and now senior executives park their private planes here. Near Google are the large manufacturing sheds of Lockheed Martin, where the aerospace and weapons manufacturing company builds hundreds 
of orbital satellites designed to look down on the activities of Earth. Next, by the Dumbarton Bridge, you'll see a collection of squat buildings that are home to Facebook, ringed with massive parking lots close to the sulfuric salt ponds of the Ravenswood Slough. From this vantage point, the nondescript suburban cul-de-sacs and industrial mid-rise of Palo Alto betrays little of its true wealth, power, and influence. There are only a few hints of its centrality in the global economy and in the computational infrastructure of the planet. But to understand AI from the perspective of deep time requires leaving Silicon Valley altogether. If you drive east from Palo Alto for around eight hours, depending how fast you drive, you'll reach the unincorporated community of Silver Peak in Nevada's Clayton Valley. Around 125 people live here, depending on how you count. And this mining town is one of the oldest in Nevada. It was almost abandoned in 1917 after the ground was stripped bare of silver and gold. It wasn't until the 1950s that people realized that Silver Peak is in fact perched on the edge of a massive underground lake of lithium. Now the valuable lithium brine under the surface is being pumped out of the ground and left in open iridescent green ponds to evaporate. It is in fact the only operating lithium mine in the United States. And this makes Silver Peak a site of intense interest to Elon Musk and other tech tycoons for one reason, rechargeable batteries. So here in a remote pocket of Nevada, is a place where the stuff of AI is made. Lithium is also known as gray gold. Smartphone batteries, for example, usually have around seven grams of this material. The Amazon Echo has around double that. But each Tesla Model S car needs about 62 kilograms of lithium for its battery pack. These kinds of batteries were never intended to supply a machine as power hungry as a car, but lithium batteries are currently the only mass market option available. All of these batteries have a limited lifespan. They are very difficult to recycle and are generally discarded as waste. Now Clayton Valley is connected to Silicon Valley in much the same way that the 19th century gold fields were to early San Francisco. The history of mining, like the devastation that it leaves in its wake, is commonly overlooked in the strategic amnesia that accompanies stories of technological progress. As the historical geographer Gray Brecken points out, San Francisco was built out of the gains of pulling gold and silver out of the lands of California and Nevada in the 1800s. The city is made from mining. The same lands that had been taken from Mexico under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago in 1848 at the end of the Mexican-American War, it was already clear at this point to settlers that these would be highly valuable gold fields. Thousands of people were forced from their homes, and then after America seized the land, the miners moved in. The land was stripped until the waterways were contaminated and many of the surrounding forests destroyed. Since antiquity, the business of mining has only been profitable because it does not have to account for its true costs, including environmental damage, the illness and death of miners, and of course, the loss to the communities that it displaces. In 1555, Georgius Agricola, known as the father of mineralogy, observed that it was clear to all that the, there was a greater detriment from mining than the value of the metals that the mining produced. In other words, those who profited from mining did so only because the costs must be sustained by others, those living and those not yet born. While it is easy to put a price on precious metals, what is the exact value of a wilderness, a clean stream or breathable air? It was never estimated, and thus a very simple calculus emerged. Extract everything as rapidly as possible. It was the move fast and break things of a different time. As San Francisco drew enormous wealth from the mines, it was easy for people to forget where it all came from. But small reminders of the mines are all around. San Francisco's buildings use the same technology that came from deep within the Central Valley for transport and life support. 
In this image, you can see diagrams from the report of the geographical exploration of the 40th parallel from 1870. The square set timbering method was used to extract ore in Nevada, and the pulley systems that carried miners down into the mine shafts were then adapted and flipped upside down to transport people in elevators to the top of the city's high rises. Corey Brecken suggests that we should think of the skyscrapers of San Francisco as inverted minescapes. The ores extracted from holes in the ground were sold to create the stories in the air. And the deeper the extractions went, the higher the great towers of office work stretched into the sky. Now San Francisco is enriched once more thanks to the extraction of substances like white lithium crystal and cobalt, vast amounts of data, and human labor all along the supply chain. About 200 miles north of Silver, Leak, of Silver Peak rather, is the Tesla Gigafactory. This image here is of the world's largest lithium battery plant. In fact, Tesla is the number one lithium ion battery consumer in the world. It is estimated to use more than 28,000 tons of lithium hydroxide annually. That's about half of the planet's total consumption. In this way, we could actually think of Tesla as being more of a battery business than a car company. A 2020 study by the University of Augsburg in Germany modeled how much lithium we may have left to mine. On the most optimistic estimate and assuming best practices of recycling, the reserves of lithium are expected to be fully depleted a few years after 2100. But without best practices, severe shortages could begin as soon as 2040. So we're starting to see an intimation of what this might feel like with the current semiconductor shortage crisis in 2021. Of course, the mining that makes AI is both literal and metaphorical. The theorists Sandro Mazadra and Brett Nielsen use the term extractivism to talk about all of the different forms of extractive operations in contemporary capitalism. The new extractivism of data mining also encompasses and propels the old extractivism of traditional mining. The cloud is the backbone of the AI industry and it's made of rocks and lithium brine and crude oil. In his book, A Geology of Media, the theorist Yossi Parika suggests that we think of media not as extensions of the human senses, as Marshall McLuhan argued, but as extensions of earth, because computational media now participate in geological and climatological processes from the transformation of the Earth's materials into infrastructures and devices. Each object in the extended network of an AI system, from routers to batteries to data centers, is built using elements that required billions of years to form within the Earth. In a single smartphone, there are 75 mineralogical elements. That's around two thirds of the periodic table. We can begin to see how on average, a 21st century person uses 10 times more minerals than one of the 20th century. From the perspective of deep time, we are extracting Earth's geological history to serve a split second of technological time. And all of this is used to build devices like Androids and iPhones that have an average lifespan of a mere 4.7 years before they are discarded. And they end up in places like this. E-waste tips used to be located in China, but China actually banned e-waste because of its severe toxic legacy. And so now it is sent to places like Thailand, Pakistan and Ghana. And this is why we need to traverse far beyond the United States to see the legacies of human and environmental damage that have powered the tech industry. There are many such sites, including the Selah in southwest Bolivia, the richest site of lithium in the world, and thus a site of ongoing political tension, as well as places in the central Congo, Mongolia, Indonesia, and the Western Australian deserts. In 2020, scientists at the US Geological Survey published a short list of the 23 minerals that are a high supply risk to manufacturers, which basically means that if they become unavailable, entire industries, including the tech sector, would grind to a halt. The critical minerals include the rare earth elements, dysprosium and neodymium, which are used inside iPhone speakers and electric vehicle motors, 
germanium, which is used in infrared military devices and in drones, and cobalt, which improves the performance of lithium ion batteries. The unique electronic, optical, and magnetic characteristics of rare earth elements cannot currently be matched by any other metals or synthetic substitutes discovered to date. Now, while they're called rare earth metals, of course, some are relatively abundant in the earth's crust, but the extraction is very costly and highly polluting. In order to refine one ton of rare earth elements, the Chinese Society of Rare Earths estimates that the process would produce 75,000 liters of acidic water and one ton of radioactive residue. Furthermore, mining and refining activities consume vast amounts of water themselves and of course generate large quantities of CO2. Another example comes from the small Indonesian islands of Bangkok and Belitung off the coast of Sumatra. These islands produce around 90% of Indonesia's tin, which is used in semiconductors. Now, Indonesia then supplies companies such as Samsung, as well as the solder makers Chenman and Shen Mao, which in their turn supply Sony, LG and Foxconn, all suppliers for Apple, Tesla and Amazon. On this tiny set of islands, mostly informal miners are on makeshift, makeshift pontoons and they use bamboo poles to scrape the seabed and dive underwater to suck tin out through giant vacuum tubes. Completely unregulated, this process unfolds beyond any formal worker or environmental protection. And in the words of the investigative journalist Kate Hodal, tin mining has scarred the landscape bulldozed the farms and forests and killed off the fish stocks and coral reefs. These are the other birthplaces of AI in the greater geography of industrial computation. Put another way, AI is a mega machine in Lewis Mumford's sense of the word. It goes far beyond databases and algorithms. It is in fact metamorphic terraforming the earth with manufacturing, transportation, undersea cables, transmission signals passing through the air, data sets scraped from the internet and continual computational cycles. And just like traditional forms of mining, it is premised on maintaining a state of ignorance. And here I'm indebted to the work of Michael, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, who refer to the dual operation of abstraction and extraction in information capitalism, effectively abstracting away the material conditions of production while extracting more information and resources. The popular descriptions of AI as fundamentally abstract distance us from the many kinds of mining that it relies upon. So let's move now from deep time to deep tissue that is to consider the human layer in AI computation. Now the common refrain is that we're living in a time of beneficial human AI collaboration in workplaces. But is this collaboration fairly negotiated? Do we ever have a choice not to collaborate with algorithmic systems? In some ways this is less of a collaboration than it is a form of duress where workers are forced to reskill, to keep up and to unquestioningly accept each new technological development. Rather than representing a, a radical new shift, I suggest that the encroachment of AI into the workplace should properly be understood as a return to older practices of industrial labor exploitation. Since the 1890s, factory labor has been increasingly subdivided into smaller actions to better suit machines. So we are witnessing new refrains on an old idea. The crucial difference is that employers now observe, assess and modulate intimate parts of the work cycle and bodily data down to the last micro movement of ligaments and facial expressions that were previously off limits. For example, in Jeff Bezos's letter to shareholders in April, he shared a, a new vision of how Amazon will deal with the high levels of musculoskeletal disorders suffered by its workers in fulfillment centers. His solution is a new algorithm that will rotate employees according to the muscle tendon groups that they use. This is, of course, surveillance into the deep tissue level and beyond. Bodies are a problem for the AI augmented workplace. In a recent US survey, 
66% of Amazon warehouse workers in New York said they experienced physical pain while performing their regular job. And 42% said they, continue, they continuously experience pain even when they are not working. The worst sites being feet, lower backs and knees. These are the musculoskeletal hotspots of value extraction. Now, instead of, say, supporting unionization or more sustainable working practices, Amazon has for years tried to create mechanized solutions. Back in 2018, as part of the Anatomy of AI project, Vladan Jola and I unearthed a little known Amazon patent for a system to keep workers and robots in close proximity. It depicted a metal cage intended for workers that can be moved through the warehouse on the same motorized system that lifts shelves filled with merchandise. So workers would be held upright in a cage which dictates and constrains their movement so they can better work with robots. Now, after we published this project, various news agencies started to report on the cage. So Amazon spoke to the press in an attempt to reassure people by stating that it never intended to implement the technology and has no plans to. But the artist Simon Denny fortunately built a physical model of the Amazon worker cage for his exhibition called Mine back in 2019. So now we can see how this form of human AI collaboration might look like. But of course, patents aren't necessarily meant to be built. Rather, they are maps of the corporate imaginary, a speculative capture of possible designs for the future. Amazon has also patented augmented reality goggles that provide turn-by-turn -turn directions with the potential to track walking speed, dwell time, and eye gaze at all times. This is literally seeing through the eyes of Amazon Corp. Here's another design imaginary. Now, one problem for Amazon is the time it takes to pick and pack multiple items in a large warehouse, which requires a lot of walking. And this is something that I saw in person when visiting Amazon's fulfillment centers for my book and seeing the amount of worker injuries and bandages and, and just chronic exhaustion from physical and psychological stress. Amazon has now patented aquatic storage facilities to create whole new ways of ordering space. Liquid-filled environments in the ocean or elsewhere would allow for packages to be stored and retrieved in what they see as a more efficient way. Depth control devices determine how buoyant packages are and would allow them to be stacked in layers and then detected via sonar. So as we see, every element of the Earth's environment is being maximized as efficient storage space for the world's biggest logistics company. But at a fundamental level, these ideas of controlled efficiency are not new. Charles Babbage is well known as the inventor of the first mechanical computer in the 1820s, the so-called difference engine. Yet Babbage also saw himself as a social theorist and wrote extensively on the nature of labor. In Babbage's more speculative writing, he argued that the industrial corporation could be understood as an analog to a computational system. Just like a computer, it included multiple specialized units, all coordinated to produce a given body of work. He imagined perfect flows of work through the factory that could be visualized as data tables and monitored by pedometers and clocks. Through a combination of computation, surveillance, and labor discipline, he argued, it would be possible to enforce ever higher degrees of efficiency and quality control. For Babbage, the value in a factory was derived from the design of its manufacturing process rather than from the labor force of its employees. The real innovation here was the logistical process, while workers were simply given tasks defined by the machines. So for Babbage, labor's role in the value production chain was largely negative. People got sick, they broke down, or they might protest. Only machines for him could be trusted. In the historian Simon Schaefer's words, for Babbage, factories looked like perfect engines and calculating machines were like perfect factories. 
I think this is a very good description of Amazon's vision as well. Among the first industries to implement Babbage's vision of the mechanized production was the Chicago meatpacking industries of the 1870s. Trains brought livestock to the stockyard gates and the animals were funneled towards their slaughter in adjacent plants and the carcasses were transported to various butchering and processing stations by means of an overhead trolley system. This formed what came to be known as the disassembly line. So when Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle, his harrowing novel about working class poverty, he set it in the meat packing plants of Chicago. His intended point was to highlight the hardships of the working poor in support of a socialist vision, but the book had an entirely different effect. The depictions of diseased and rotting meat prompted a public outcry over food safety and resulted in the Meat Inspection Act of 1906. But the focus on workers was lost. Powerful institutions were prepared to try new designs for food safety, but not to address the more fundamental exploitative labor dynamics. We see this pattern play out over centuries of how power responds to critique, whether the product is cow carcasses or facial recognition, the response is to accept regulation at the margins, but to leave untouched the underlying logics of production. So, try and start our new session for you. Here we are. Hopefully this now will work. And welcome to Deep Space. So what is the latest extension of the practices of extraction beyond earthly resources and human bodies. Well, now it has become space extraction, where the mine that sustains the tech sector extends into the solar system. This is the politics of asteroid mining and deep space colonization. The ideology of these space spectacles is deeply interconnected with that of the AI industry itself. Extreme wealth and power generated from technology companies now enables a small group of men to pursue their own private space race. Tech billionaires are now competing to see who can leave the planet first. There's a striking promotional video by Jeff Bezos's space company, Blue Origin, that reveals some of the thinking behind the privatized space race. You can hear Bezos describe it in a voiceover, and I'll quote it for you here. This is the most important work I'm doing, he says. It's a simple argument. This is the best planet. And so we face a choice. As we move forward, we're going to have to decide whether we want a civilization of stasis. We will have to cap population. We will have to cap energy usage per capita. Or we can fix that problem by moving out into space, end quote. In the near term, Blue Origin is building reusable rockets and lunar landers at this suborbital base in West Texas. By 2024, the company wants to be shuttling astronauts and cargo to the moon. But in the longer term, the company's mission is far more ambitious, to help bring about a future in which millions are living and working in space. Specifically, Bezos has outlined his hopes to build giant space colonies where people will live in floating manufactured environments. Heavy industry would move off planet altogether. Meanwhile, Earth would be zoned for residential building and light industry, left as, in Bezos's own words, a beautiful place to live and a beautiful place to visit, presumably for those who can afford it when they're not working in the off-world colonies. Now, if all of this sounds oddly familiar to you, it might be because Bezos' inspiration for conquering space comes in part from the science fiction novelist Jared K. O'Neill. O'Neill wrote The High Frontier, a 1976 fantasy of space colonization, which includes these lush illustrations of moon mining, and Bezos' plan for Blue Origin specifically name checks O'Neill as an inspiration for a permanent human settlement in space. In fact, O'Neill's fiction was driven by the dismay and shock that he felt when he read the 1972 landmark report by the Club of Rome called The Limits to Growth. The report published the first data models that predicted that resources and population worldwide was likely to collapse by the year 2100, 
unless the global policy agenda rapidly reduced the gap between rich and poor nations. In writing The High Frontier, O'Neill wanted to imagine a different way out of a possible no growth future. By focusing on deep space, O'Neill redirected global anxiety during the 1970s oil crisis with visions of serene space structures that would simultaneously preserve the status quo. If Earth doesn't have enough surface area, O'Neill wrote, then humans should simply build more. If we face shortages of key minerals or the climate actually begins to threaten business, simply move the extraction horizon ever further out. Now, of course, Bezos is not alone. Elon Musk has announced his intention to colonize Mars within 100 years. Musk has advocated terraforming the surface of Mars for human settlement by exploding nuclear weapons at the poles. SpaceX even made a t-shirt that reads, Nuke Mars. Musk also conducted what is arguably the most expensive public relations stunt in history when he launched a Tesla car into heliocentric orbit on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket. Now, researchers estimate that the car will remain in space for millions of years, a truly boundless horizon of time for a form of promotional space junk. That the ideology of space colonization and frontier mining have become the common corporate fantasies of tech billionaires, I think underscores a fundamentally troubling relationship to Earth. The language of the tech elite echoes settler colonialism, seeking to displace Earth's population and capture territory for mineral extraction. Silicon Valley space race similarly assumes that the last commons, outer space, can be taken by whichever tech empire gets there first. And this is despite the main convention that governs space mining, the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which recognizes that space is, and I quote, in the common interest of all mankind, and that any exploration or use should be carried on for the benefit of all peoples. But back in 2015, Bezos's Blue Origin and Musk's SpaceX lobbied the Obama administration to enact the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act. This extends an exemption for commercial space companies from federal regulation and allows them to own any mining resources extracted from asteroids and keep the profits. It is a whole new enclosure of the commons. And perhaps it's no surprise that many of the Silicon Valley's elite are invested in abandoning the planet because space colonization fits very well alongside the other imaginaries of life extension dieting and blood transfusions from teenagers, brain uploading to the cloud and vitamins for immortality. It is a whispered summons to become the ubermensch, to exceed all boundaries, be they biological, social, ethical or ecological. But as Mackenzie Walker's asked, should we think of this as fundamentally different than the usual feral kinds of capitalism, as this could perhaps be more than just the usual dystopia of the Silicon Valley imagination, or as Walk describes it, could all of this be something worse? This photograph that I'm showing you here, by the way, I took on a field trip visit to Blue Origin's suborbital launch facility in West Texas. When you look at the clusters of sheds that mark out the rocket base, it feels very provisional and, and strangely makeshift in this dry expanse of the Permian Basin. The vast span of the valley is broken with this single circle, the landing pad where Blue Origin's reusable rockets are meant to touch down. And that's all there is to see. It's a private infrastructure in progress, guarded and gated, and it provides a very bare techno-scientific vision of power, extraction and escape. It is a hedge against Earth. And I think this is why different visions of pluralizing the Anthropocene are so urgently needed. Although, as Anna Singh has noted in an earlier lecture in this series, this will not be easy. Such an ethos of alternative terrestrial visions with different modes of ecological homeostasis would be to create what Ashilambembe calls a different politics of inhabiting the Earth, of repairing and sharing the planet. Or what 
J.K. Gibson Graham describes as ethical coordinates for a new kind of interdependence between humans, non-humans and ecologies. It cannot come too soon. And indeed, there may be ways in which it is too late for us at least. Just before the pandemic hit, I made my last trip to Silver Peak. As I walked up the hills behind the mine through the remnants, I found this ghost town called Blair. Now in the early 1900s, Blair was a thriving town based around gold and silver mining. Hundreds of people came here for work and cheap housing. But with so much mining activity, the cyanide began to poison the ground and the gold and the silver began to falter and dry up. By 1918, Blair was completely deserted. It was all over within 12 years. And I was struck by the realization that Silver Peak will also be a ghost town soon. The current draw on the lithium mine is very aggressive in response to the high demand, and no one really knows exactly how long it will last. The most optimistic estimate is 80 years, but of course the end may come much sooner. Then the lithium pools under the Clayton Valley will be gone, extracted for batteries that are destined for landfill. And Silver Peak will return to its previous life as an empty and quiet place on the edge of an ancient salt lake, now drained. Thank you. Let me turn off these slides so I can join you. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. It was uh, really an amazing presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And uh, are you with us? I'm with you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. It's just because you're. Uh, see if the video has stopped. Yeah. Can you see the slides? Face, or has the slides your face seems to be frozen somehow. So. Uh oh. Well, let's see if we can bring me back. Yeah, I was wondering if something happened. Uh, if I can see it here, fine. It says everything is perfect. Okay, so, so oh. just probably just a minute. Okay, thank you. I was uh, see because I have to follow the chat, but uh, I'm just waiting to see uh, the questions will 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 certainly rise. But I was just wondering, you know, it was really a, a brilliant way of addressing the topic and thank you for that. Uh, I, I was wondering while you were presenting the, the topics, uh, it's it's true that uh, a lot of us that are not really deeply involved in the, I mean, we don't totally understand what's going on in the, in, in, in the sense that you so clearly presented. Uh, was wondering if is, is there still a chance you know for us to really benefit from this um, AI without this feeling of going into into <laughs> uh, into a black box where you, you don't even you don't you don't really know who is going to play the rules or are we going to be captured more again is like if this is a non-ending narrative we've been captured uh, by these corporates and all these, uh, is it is it that we are going into the same, but but upscaling in terms of uh, of this process of losing the competence of of connecting and to play an individual or even some kind of role besides the, because it seems that we are we've been kept by by this big machine of of power and. Uh, or is it still time to benefit somehow from this AI technology and uh, in, 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 a, in a good way, let's say, so that everybody everywhere will benefit from it? Or I think you know this is the the way that the question is, I think, so commonly placed yes. to us, which is that we can only accept. Uh, AI as it is already given, the already existing AI, because we're told that it will have such great benefits, um, which is often stated as, a, as an article of faith uh, without any kind of evidence proving that this will be the case. It makes me think, in fact, of uh, IBM Watson's um, health 
initiative, which went for many years and was widely advertised and promoted uh, as being, you know, the AI system that would help us solve cancer. Um, and of course, despite billions of dollars spent on marketing and promotion, you know, this, uh, this entire program of IBM Watson for Health was quietly shuttered in 2020. So even for the most hyped types of AI benefits, I think we have to be far more skeptical about what we're getting in terms of these so-called benefits. Even yeah. when I think there are sort of clear and very fascinating moments um, in terms of what AI, AI can do, and, and clearly with any kind of large statistical analysis course, there, there are things that are important. I could think here, of, for example, the um, protein folding work um, that was recently published yeah. in Nature. Here too, though, we so rarely talk about the externalities. You know, what were the numbers of GPUs that were spun up to actually make that happen? You know, what are the energy consumptions that are being you know, silently agreed to all along the supply chain to make these systems work? Because so much of the process of the production of AI is occluded, we're not able to make these choices in ways that are in any way clear eyed. We're simply being told to accept them. So in answer to your question, I think really are we even expected to have a choice or to have any agency in how these systems are applied in everyday life, we're simply expected to accept them. And I think this is part of the broader problem of these these kinds of technologies, which are presented as though they are uh, in the term that Alex Campolo and I use um, as systems of enchanted determinism, that they're somehow magical and superhuman, yet deterministic in that they can be used with predictive certainty for the future. And that, sort of, that dual operation of enchanted determinism, I think, has really encouraged uh, a narrative where we do not ask hard questions of AI, um, where they have to be held at arm's length and couldn't possibly be regulated or critically examined. And unfortunately, I think the opposite is true. Yeah, but for example, you were showing us uh, this situation in Nevada, which I read one of these, I don't know if in Financial Times, one of these days, what is happening with this big mine of lithium in, in Nevada. We are living a very similar situation in, in Portugal because we are one of the countries in Europe. We are, I think we have the, the, the biggest uh, mine of lithium. And this, there's a big debate there because uh, if if we go if we if we if we if we allow the extraction of lithium, we will lose one of the best spots for nature conservation. And um, but but this this is a very a very difficult choice because on one hand you have the COP26 and all these in, a, in the you know, know the transition for decarbonizing the economy. So you are. You, you are placed into this narrative of you don't have, as you said, there's no other option because if we don't go into this batteries and all this, uh, you, you, you cannot have uh, the transition that, that the world needs. But when you have the communities and local communities facing this choice, I mean, if even uh, the local communities tend, tend to favor the, the, uh, the no going, you know, they tend to favor the uh, they tend to preserve the nature and all the, the the cultural heritage they have locally, but on the other hand, the pressure on them is so huge that I mean, how can you avoid this? I mean, is um, it's like in fact, it's like if you don't have a choice because the 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 the, the debate is already contaminated by the strongest narrative that is that is already. I mean, it's. It's like if, if it's, it's a nonsense, it's like, again, we, we, we are still in this environmental debate of choosing the, 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 back, back, the going back or it's like if, if you don't choose the future, if you don't, if you don't accept that this, um, if you don't accept. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, this, this is very difficult. I mean, because you, 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 you have to, you, you put, the communities and um, and sometimes without literacy to address them. Um, it, it's it's the it's easier. It's I mean it's it's a not not easy choice. So I don't know. It's just uh, I'm 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 just sharing with you because it's one of it's really a hot issue also in my country as well because we we have uh, a lot of pressure to to give it up because it's it's. I mean, it's uh, it's also a matter of survival in terms of uh, country-wise. Uh, 
exactly but, and yeah. that's relevant to your work too in terms of conservation of, of yeah. spaces that are, are you know commonly seen as how do we create space for uh, you know non-human ecologies that should be prized and valued as much as the minerals that they may contain and yet time and time again we're presented with these false binaries where well you know if we can't have you know we, we can't possibly keep the system of automobiles as we currently have them therefore we must move to electric vehicles as though it's yeah. one or the other rather than shifting to different conversations around public transport or how else might we be using these resources rather yeah. than generating yet more kind of private vehicles that are sort of running on large amounts of of lithium so i think you know you're exactly right that part of this has to do with these deep narratives of technological inevitability you know of this idea that because the technology is here and it, it is represents the future that it is inevitable it must be embraced it must be the only way and yeah. and that is one of the core things that I, I think we must be far more prepared to question and to unseat sure. precisely that belief it's true but you know uh, just i think last week i saw i uh, read uh, an editorial of science the, you know the science journal mm -hmm. and, uh, the editorial was about is uh, the, the idea that uh, because if you avoid external externalities then might be that is you can it's it's a go you can you can go for it because that as long as you avoid this this impact of the of mining and uh, and and the editorial was exactly about it that it seems that well, they just claiming that uh, there are technologies rising that may avoid these impacts in in mining in the mining industry, so that you can you can you can take the minerals and and avoid you know the impacts. So that's okay, you know. So mm -hmm. again, again, you put more technology, or you you and uh, uh, so that you can accept it and it's easier for 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 everybody to accept it uh, as it is. Because but so so instead of searching for a human harmony you keep going into more and more technology even though you, you don't know if it's really going to take you anywhere so it's really a, a very <laughs> it was just uh, but but it, it was the editorial science and i, I was uh, impressed by it you mm. we have a question so mm. i guess the one because you you have to leave it uh, soon and we have a question. Someone is, uh, thank you so much for your fascinating talk. It was really informative and thought provoking. Do you see the ubiquity of AI as a hyper object? And could you comment on the connection between AI and transhumanism and its socio ecological implications? Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you so much for this question. Um, and yes, I noticed in your introduction, Helena, you, you also use this uh, concept from Timothy Morton of the hyper object. And I think in many ways it is. And, and, and what is so interesting to me is to sort of think about the intellectual history of these types of hyper objects or in in Mumford's words, these sort of mega machines, these machines that draw on so many different parts of the sort of socio-political landscape while at the same time kind of escaping the ability for us to truly grasp you know how they work and how they function um, itself of course is now a function of so much of late capitalism that we accept systems that we really do not understand how they how they actually work how they are produced and then how they are ultimately uh, discarded. So I think in this sense, you can think of AI as a hyper object. But for me, I also feel a certain amount of frustration in terms of what is the type of work that is needed to actually bring about the urgent changes that we need in terms of regulating these systems. Of course, what we've seen in the EU is the first ever Omnibus Act, the draft AI Act, which is, of course, designed for the first time to regulate artificial intelligence. Um, and while there are a few other analogues that are starting to you know, emerge worldwide, we're very far behind. So for me, you know, part of what it is to sort of move beyond the, the ways in which hyper objects escape us is to pin down how we might actually regulate control and in some senses refuse 
artificial intelligence, you know, to, to move exactly against what you were describing, Helena, is this, this idea that this is the future, we must accept it. How do we begin to exercise that muscle of the politics of refusal and to say, mm. no, this is actually not a system that we need and want? Um, but the second part of your question, you know, draws us to uh, AI and transhumanism, which of course, you know, has become, you know, a very kind of prominent part of the debate around artificial intelligence. And of course, we now see Elon Musk and others investing large amounts of money into what it is to create kind of transhuman forms of life, including this idea of uploading the brain to the cloud. And I do see this as also part of the phantasmagoria of AI, this kind of mythic belief that AI mm. is just a, a disembodied brain and can be completely sort of removed from the material embodiment that, say, humans have. Um, and, and this kind of Cartesian dualism has been kind of core to the AI field since its inception in the 1950s, and I, I see it as a fundamental misapprehension. And of course, we can go back to uh, sort of feminist um, phenomenologists and, and the work that they've done from the mid 20th century onward in rethinking the relationship between embodiment and cognition. Mm. But transhumanism, it has an extremely dark strand. I mean, we could look to uh, Jeffrey Epstein, sort of convicted um, uh, child sex trafficker, who was deeply committed to transhumanism and in fact was doing such horrific things as storing his sperm in order to impregnate as many people as possible to carry his genes into the future. And of course, many other tales from within the tech world of this desire to exceed kind of the boundaries of the body and of life. And I think it it is premised on a, a deep fear of death and a deep fear of what it is to acknowledge that we could be living and the end of history, that we are living at a time when not only are we looking at our own death, but also potentially the death of the species. And mm. I'm thinking here of a, um, a new book that's coming out shortly by um, Timothy Beale uh, called When Time Is Running Short. And, and this book, which is looking at this stage of the Anthropocene, is really powerfully suggesting that we actually need to think perhaps of this as a time of grief rather than clinging to a false hope or this idea of, you know, perhaps if we become transhuman, that we can escape the velocity of, of what is to come, that instead part of the shift we need to make is, is almost towards a palliative mode, is to be thinking about this as end of life and, and to think about the care practices for each other, but also for the planet more widely than that would introduce. And while that might sound extreme, and it certainly sounds very, bleak. I do wonder if that kind of shift in thinking is actually going to bring us to a far more grounded understanding of thinking about this, this shift towards pluralizing the Anthropocene than it would be to pin our hopes to sort of transcending the human form. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Kate. We, we, we do have uh, one or two more questions, but I know that you we are running out of time, so I won't uh, really <laughs> take your time longer. But just just very briefly, um, if you'd like to ask to respond to again, you have another compliment regarding your talk and thank you, thanking you for your talk. Um, uh, someone is asking what can be done to reorient the foundations of AI. AI in a more sustainable, less exploitative direction? Mm. Well, this, of course, is um, very much the, the, the most timely question. Uh, I have been pleased to see that just in the last 12 months or so, there is a growing debate inside the tech sector about how to reconceptualize the way that systems work from uh, more efficient chipsets through to reducing the size of data sets in order to reduce the amount of uh, computational cycles and, and therefore energy expenditure. But the question really, I think, provokes a, a much bigger 
kind of uh, response than simply tweaking at the edges. I mean, this is you know something that we were discussing today, which is that you know are we simply just making modifications to the deck chairs on the Titanic rather than looking at the sort of fundamental conception of how these systems are used? So I think in answer to your question. I think we have to do something far more profound in understanding where these systems are being used, because at the same time as we're having these conversations about the very real carbon footprint of AI, the field is moving into these large computational models and um, things like GPT-3 that are truly vast, not just in terms of the scale, but in terms of the energy needed to propel them. So I, I worry that even with this knowledge, we're seeing this sort of push towards gargantuan scale and the politics of scale and AI. So mm -hmm. the question is, when will the knowledge create the change in the industrial production and can it? Mm -hmm. Many thanks, Kate, for your wonderful contribution to Pluralizing the Anthropocene. Truly inspiring talk and discussion. Before you all go, let me just remind you that the next session of Pluralizing the Anthropocene will take place next Monday, December 6 at 6 p.m. GMT Lisbon time. We'll have the pleasure to host award-winning author Raj Patel. We'll talk about the world ecology approach in this contribution to making sense of capitalism's environmental history and today's planetary crisis. The event is free, but registration is required. Please register and the events webpage in the Sir Alba's website. And many thanks once again for your support. See you again next week. Thank you, Kate. Bye bye. Have a nice day. Thanks so much, Helena. Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining.